as I'm sure most of you know, that for several years I have been out of the bake sale circuit because of the busyness and the different community obligations. Of course, I make exceptions from time to time. This is the 14th exception I'm making this year. But I think the most important exception, because it's for a charity that is very dear to me and very close to my heart, an organization that I was there from the beginning, so I know it. Nobody has to tell me about it. Usually when I come to these events, they have to explain to me what they're doing so I can explain it to the people. Nobody has to explain anything to me. I can explain it to them. Just to hear some good history, good Jewish history. Maybe about 10 years ago, maybe a little less, in the synagogue every day I would say before the end of the prayers, a halakha. In English, just so they know what to do. This is permissible, this is forbidden, don't do this, yeah, do this. So one of the boys had an idea. Rabbi, why don't you tape it? I said, what are we going to do with the tape? He said, it doesn't matter what we do with it. Let's tape it, and then we'll figure out later on what to do with it. It doesn't cost us anything. You just have to push a button. So in those days, I was scared of tape recorders. Now I'm not scared anymore of them. So I was a little hesitant, but they said, Big deal, Hakam, if you don't like it, we don't have to do anything with it. I said, fine. So we collected hundreds of them. Today, it's thousands of them. Baruch Hashem, Ken So somebody said, Rabbi, why don't we make a website where the people who are not in the shul can hear the halakha. Maybe they can go to a website, they push a button, they can hear what you said. So we started our first website called Daily Halakha. DailyHalakha.com That's how it started. Then somebody came to us and they said, Rabbi, why don't you have it written also? Maybe somebody doesn't want to hear it. Maybe they want to read it. As a boy, I don't have time to write every halakha. It takes too much time. We have it answered. We found a rabbi in Israel, 6,000 miles away, who is an expert transcriber. He hears information and he writes it. To be honest with you, his written word is better than my spoken word. So we made a system where we still do it. I did it this morning. We say a halakha in Brooklyn or in Deal. Then we send the audio to Israel. And the guy in Israel writes it. He sends it back to New York. I proofread it. And we put it on the website. Today the website mails out to over 13,000 people around the world. And I know that they're enjoying it. How do I know? Because I travel around the world, as many of you know. Recently I got a call from a good friend of mine from Panama, which some of my best friends are in Panama. And those that are from Panama here today, God bless them all. With Arikut Jameen, Mushtot Hayim. So he called me Sir Hakam. Half the community is in uproar. They're not getting the emails. I said, the truth is, I'm not in charge of the emails. I have enough things to worry about, computers, things. But I said, if you're calling me, I'll take care of it. I called up the webmaster. He says, you're right. Central America, we're having a problem with. We fixed it, Baruch Hashem. So I know they're listening. I know they're enjoying it. We're spoiled in New York, in New Jersey. We have Baruch Hashem Hakamim, Kudanu Hakamim, Kudanu Nebonim. Today we can go to 10 classes in one day. We have rabbis all over the place, Ken Yirbu. But if you go outside of our region, they're much more rare, and they're much more scarce. These events don't happen every moment, so they appreciate it much more. I was three years ago in Beverly Hills. I go usually this time of year. And I was in the synagogue in Beverly Hills, it's a Persian school. And I walk into the synagogue and I see a big frame, like this window over here. A big frame, and it's locked. And it says on top, daily halakha, and there's a, a paper inside. And there's a guy in charge every day. He opens the closet, he takes off the old one, 
and he puts the new one. So I was reading it. So somebody comes to me. As I'm reading it, he says, it's very good, you should read it. <laughs> of course I'm reading it. It is very good, I agree with you, it's excellent. <laughs> so they're enjoying it. In Mexico City, throughout the country, in Florida for sure, in Venezuela, they're getting the halakha. But the biggest compliment that we got from daily halakha was the following. Originally, the one that was setting it up for us was the grandson of Acham of Adya Yosef. He's a computer genius. His name is Shemuel Sasson. He's a genius in computers. I don't know how we found him. Nasib, how we, we found each other. And he ran the whole website. Then he moved back to Israel. He called us two years ago. He said, Rabbi, with your permission, my grandfather heard about the site Delhi Halakha, and he said, we have to do it in Hebrew. Do you mind if we copy it? I once heard from a great rabbi, the best compliment is imitation. When they start imitating you, then you know you succeeded. That's why when the young boys make fun of my speaking, I feel flattered that they're making fun in the camps. They're saying, they're talking like me. So it must be a good thing. That means they know you. So today, Chacham of Adyaz, Grandchildren and children started their own website of Delhi Halakha for Israelis and it's in Nashuna Kodesh. And I'm proud to tell you they're even more successful than our website. I don't know how many tens of thousands of emails they get a day or they send out a day throughout the world. So Baruch Hashem, our good idea had babies. Delhi Halakha had a baby. I was recently in Toronto. In Toronto they have the Moroccan community. And they have different halachot than we have. It's the same Torah I think they have as us, but they have different, I know they have the same Torah as us, but they have different minhagim. So a lot of the things that we say on our website is more geared to our, our way. So they wanted to make their own website, so they asked me permission. You don't have to ask me permission, it's not my Torah. Go do it. No, we want more than permission, we want advice. Who do we speak to? How do we set it up? There's all the information. Today, Baruch Hashem, throughout Canada, they have their own daily halakha for the Moroccan community. That's another baby of the daily halakha. Because of this one idea of one boy who said, Rabbi, put the halakha on tape. Look how much Torah of halakhot. You know, we go to so many classes, and every rabbi has stories. This story, and that story, and this story. Everybody knows every story. But ask them a question on halakhot Shabbat, they don't know what to do. But they can tell you a story. They know all the Musar and all the Parashah and everything. But ask them a question about the, the milk fell into the pot. They have no idea. But I can tell you a story. So the daily halakha has necessity in order to know what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. Anyway, that's the story of daily halakha. And it didn't end the story. I know there's going to be a lot of good, more children that are going to be born from this website. Every Friday we send out a Parashat to Shavuah from the website. And other things are there that for another time I can discuss. I get excited when I talk about it because I'm just thinking about all the hashkaha, all the divine providence that we have with the success. Rabbi Penhasi from Israel once told me that you're running the biggest yeshiva in the world. But why do you say that, Acham? He says, there's 13,000 students in this yeshiva. He says, come to my yeshiva, we have a few hundred boys. Of course, he was exaggerating. It's not really a yeshiva. It's a virtual yeshiva. But a very big uh, compliment was when the editors of Art Scroll, Art Scroll Publications, they heard about the website. They said, you have to make a book. It should be printed in a book. And as you know, Baruch Hashem, we printed the first book, Daily Halakha, but Hasbashalom, I'm not coming here to boast. That's not my intention, even though it sounds like I'm boasting, because I'm excited. It's a good boasting of the, of the, of the success it's nothing to do with us. Without Bure Ulam's Biracha, uh, uh, none of this would be able to happen. I'm just relaying to you the success that Bure Ulam gave to this project. Anyway, from there, somebody said, all these CDs that we have, they said that maybe at the time Rico was producing a half a million CDs a year. Half a million CDs. What a number. And they're free. They're all over the place. It's not a person that ever picked up a CD. 
even myself, I want to listen to what the other rabbis are saying. Because I have to hear what the competition is saying, so I know what, what, the, what, what I have to uh, compete. So, the CDs are unbelievable. They're all over the place. In Las Vegas, in uh, 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 California, in Seattle, in South America, wherever you go, somehow these CDs, and we started recycling them. When somebody would finish the CD, we would collect all the old ones, and we send them to different countries, we send them to different places. Somebody's old, old stuff is to somebody else a treasure. So we sent it to them. Anyway, we put these CDs on the website, which we came here today to support, LearnTorah.com. Maybe there's maybe 5,000 titles today on every subject. Pesha, Derash, Remez, Sod, English, uh, 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 all topics from all uh, different speakers on uh, uh, an array of subjects. It's unbelievable. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I know we get about one to 2,000 people a day that go to the website watching it, looking at it, and on Tisha B'Av itself, all those speeches that they made in the synagogue, we live simulcast, like, it's like TV, the Havdil, the rabbi said TV is not good, but this is a good TV, where it's all the hachamim giving the rashot. I think at one point there was like 3,500 people watching the rashot. I know it because I got texts from all over the world. Rabbi, great speech, great speech. What are you talking about, great speech? What speech? I saw you on the internet. And the site has been used for many good things. For many good things. And for many tragic things, I'm sorry to tell you, as well. Uh, when my good friend in uh, Mexico had passed away, Moshe Saba al Shalom, who was a very uh, close uh, friend, and his friend, uh, Alhemah Shalom. So, I had the very difficult responsibility to deliver a hispid, a eulogy. But the people in Mexico wanted to hear, what is the rabbi going to say? How are we going to do it? Very simple, one call to Mexico, set up a computer, one call to Rico, set up Deli Hanak, to set up the website, and they're able to watch live what's going on in New York, What's going on in Mexico? The, the website is able to unite the entire world. And then when we made the eulogies in Sharesion, they were able to watch the eulogies in Mexico as well. So we use the website for good things. We use the website also for sometimes unfortunate situations as well. But Baruch Hashem, everything is the Shem Shamaim, I could, I could tell you. I don't think we charge anything on the website. Mostly, I don't think we charge. Maybe if they want to take a CD off the website, we charge them a dollar. <laughs> I don't know even why we do that. We think maybe if we charge a dollar, we'll be able to pay for... But it doesn't, doesn't do anything. We do it. I have to figure out why we do it. By the way, there's a reason why we said to do it. From there, came another website. When I was young, I used to go to a, a, a class with my rabbi Hachab Baruch Alev Shalom, when I used to spend the summers in Deal, this is 35 years ago, when I was 6 or 7 years old, or maybe a little older when I just got Bar Mitzvah, Hachab Baruch used to give a class in the shul, Chok Yisrael, I don't know what Chok Yisrael is, and all the men would sit around the table, and I just remember it was a very enjoyable class, he starts off with Perasha, then you go to Navi, then you go to Tehillim, and then you go to Mishleh, then you go to Mishnah, then you go to Gemara, then you go to Zohar, then you go to Gemara. I said, wow, what, a, what an item. And in 42 minutes, you went around the world and came back. And it was so, your brain would be filled when you came out of the rabbi's go, whoa, I can't believe all the Hindushim that the rabbi said. So I always had in my mind, and I always remember my grandfather, Allah Shalom. When he used to come home from work, I used to see in his uh, attaché case, he would have Chokli Israel. Then I started to realize that in our community, this was the minhag, that the men, before they would go to work, they would read Chokli Israel. Everybody, wherever you go in the world, Chok, who's giving the Chok class? Everybody reads Chok. I didn't know this, I was a kid. In my mind, I said, one day, I also want to give the Chokli Israel class. Baruch Hashem, two years ago, we gave the Chok. From Parashat Bereshit all the way to the end of the Zot Berachah. This morning we gave the Chok as well, but we put it on tape. 
And we made a website, dailyhokliisrael.com. And now any man, any Sephardi in the world, Ashkenaz also, they can go to the website. They put, what's today? Uh, Thursday? Thursday, Perashat, Ve'it Hanan, click. Boom, you hit it from the beginning to the end, every single word interpreted. It's a big benefit to the people. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist such a thing. Then after we finished that project, we're not finished it, we still do it every day. So you can go here last year's version, this year's version, <laughs> it is every year we'll put another version of this. Then I had an idea because I went to a rabbi Pinto uh, last year, a year and a half ago, and he was giving a speech about a rabbi called the Pedi Yoetz, Rabbi Eliezer Papo. And he's talking about him. And he said Every year he goes with a group of people to, to the grave of Rabbi Nezir Papo. I think he's buried in Bulgaria. Wherever it is, you have to look at the map inside where Bulgaria is. And the, he said, the Pelioids, whoever goes to his kever and prays by the kever and asks, he'll give him a, a redemption. He'll give him a Yeshua. So he goes every year. I said, what is this Pelioids? What is this book over here, Pelioids? I went, I bought the book. I saw the book, Pedli or Eitz, I went out of my mind. It's the advice of life. Every day he gives you one page of advice. On every subject you could ever imagine on life. To raising children, to making money, to, to, uh, to how to eat, how to sleep, how to give charity. But a book this big, I don't know, maybe there's 500 different topics in the book. So, I said to myself, to the, to the boys in the shul, boys, we have to learn this book. They said, Rabbi, let's put it on the put it on the website. So we started a new website this year, pillyoeds.com. Every day, you could read and listen to the interpretation of the pillyoeds, and I know the people are enjoying it because we get emails all over. Rabbi, great class, we enjoyed it. What did you mean? What does it say? And I'm sorry to tell you, we also get mail that is not so favorable sometimes as well. You cannot make everybody happy. That's okay, we delete those messages. <laughs> Last but not least, the crown, the ketir of this organization, seven and a half years ago, the world started a new cycle of the study of the Talmud. I know most of you ladies don't study Talmud, and I don't recommend it either to you. You'd be better off reading a cookbook or something that would enhance your your marriages and your shalom bayit. Anyway, they started reading Gemara. And this program is they read one page of Gemara every day. You know how much it is to read a page of Gemara? Even to read three lines is a lot. But they're very, very, it's like a regiment. Imagine going to exercise and they tell you, you have to lift 100 pounds. You 100 pounds, like, give me 5 pounds, it's too hard 100. But that's what it is, it's a very strict exercise. One page a day, 7 days a week, on Yom Kippur, every single day, 7 and a half years, no break. Even with the vacation, you have to learn. Anyway, we started it. And we put the Gemara on tape. And we made a website, dailygemara.com. Now we're 6 and a half years in. Be'azat Hashem, one year from now, meaning in uh, August, August 2012 will be seven and a half years, they're going to make a big party, and they're going to finish the entire Talmud, the whole world, which is a, a monumental accomplishment. But for us, it's exciting because now anybody who's a Sfaradi, who wants to hear the way we learn the Gemara, with our, our way we speak, with our way that we study, can go on the line and put Gemara Shabbat, page 64. Boom. And you hear the, the whole the, the, the daf. What I got excited was, we didn't know who's going to listen to it. We said, what's the difference? We'll put it on. It doesn't cost too much. We'll put it online. Let them listen. The kids from the yeshiva, Magen David and Flapush, they came to me in the summer. And Rabbi Eli, thank you very much. Thank you very much, what? So we had a final in Magen David. On Masechet Sukkah. They learned Gemara the whole year. Now they have a final on 10 pages. 
They said, how are we going to review 10 pages? So they told us about the website. We went to the website, Masih Sukkah, boom. We listened to the 10 pages online, a review, and now we're able to enjoy it. Two years ago, I was with my wife in Boca Raton, in Florida. I was in a, a, a restaurant alone, minding my own business. And somebody came to me and said, Rabbi Mansour, so how do you know? I have a baseball hat on, I have sunglasses on. How do you know? So I heard your voice. Uh, the voice gave it away. Anyway, he said, I just want to thank you. I'm the principal of the yeshiva in Boca Raton. And when I go to the yeshiva and I drive back and forth, I listen to the daily Gemara. Not that you're teaching it to me, because I didn't know how to learn it already. I don't need you to teach me the Gemara, but I use it as a review. I like to hear the Gemara over and over in the car, just to hear the question, the answer, the question, the answer. Wow. What a, what an item. How, is, how, would we able, how would we be able to touch somebody so far away without this, the web, with these websites? That's why I believe it's a very, very noble, noble cause. The money that we use from these events, which is the first event we ever made really, is just to make more CDs, to make more websites. It doesn't cost us millions of dollars, but it costs us money to pay for the programmers, to pay for the upkeep, to pay for the different uh, maintenance, and there's glitches, and to pay for the guy in Israel, to pay for... It costs us money, and Baruch Hashem, we're not complaining, and we want to keep everything for free, but I just believe it's a big zikhut for our community to be part of it. As of last year, the websites are influencing 84 countries. I think they only have about 70 countries in the UN, but somehow we're reaching... 84 countries, which is, a, which is a great accomplishment as well. I want to thank the host, hostess, the Gabbais, that there's no better way to open their home. They had a beautiful Chinuch last night, and today they brought rabbis to the house to say the Bnei Torah. The house is lucky. There's good luck. There's a good mazal in the house. Whenever you start a house on the right foot, on the right uh, uh, footing, it sets, the, it sets the pace and the tempo for the next hundred years, Ba'azat Hashem. This will be binyan adi'ad. And od yishama bebayit zeh. Kol sason ve kol simcha, kol hatan ve kol kala, kol metzalot atanim upatam, un arim emeshten ginatam, amen ken yirason. I want to thank Michelle Rudy, Shem Mishmer ve Hayeha, and all the, yes, she deserves a, an applause. A few weeks ago, she mentioned to me that she has an idea to maybe do something. I said, you know what, Michelle, come to my house. She brought some woman to the house, to my house in deal, and we sat down in the, in the dining room. And I just gave them a little understanding of what we're doing on the, on the web. I said, okay, Akam, you finished? I'm finished. Go inside. And all of a sudden, like a, like a, like a tornado, these women in about 20 minutes, boom! What they did, every, I'll do this, you do that, you do that. It was going so fast, the conversations, that I didn't, I didn't think anybody understands what's going on over here. It was like the stock market. If you ever see pictures in the stock market, buy, sell, sell, buy. And you don't know, how, how does anybody understand what's going on over here? And that's what they were doing. And they're writing, and they're writing, and they're doing that. Huh? Okay, they're finished. I said, Michelle, is this, this, done. Next up, what else you want? <laughs> I don't believe all these women are, are amazing. Bet Yaakov, that's the Bet Yaakov. That's the, the greatness of our Jewish women that Baruch Hashem are able to organize these events. It's a lot of work, but they do it. They make it look easy. They make it look seamlessly. Last but not least. This is not the first bake sale of the summer. This might be the 50th bake sale of the summer. And I think there's no community in the world that generates more charity in the two months of the summer than our community. And I'm not only talking about what we collect in synagogues. I'm talking about from the women. We're selling donuts. Our community sells more baked goods than Dunkin' Donuts, than the biggest bakeries. They sell more food than the biggest food chains. I don't know how they do it. They make the food. They bring it. They bring gifts. They our community is protected because of this. It's an insurance policy. 
I always get scared when I see our children riding on the Ocean Avenue with their bicycles. And you see them on Norwood Avenue and their bicycles. And you see the kids in their cars. And they're going down the blocks. And they're doing all their things. And there's so much concentration of thousands of people in just a, a small area. And the kids on the beach. And the kids in the ocean. And I always walk by and say, Shomer Israel. We need a tremendous amount of protection because the kids are not in school. The kids are out in the street in the summer. And they're out till all hours of the night. And I have a true belief that because we collect so much charity, the community is under a cloud. There's a divine protection and a providence and a security. The protector of Israel that doesn't sleep nor slumber is watching us. So the benefit of these is not only for learn Torah or whatever. The benefit is for for Kla Yisrael, for, for, our, for our nation. The other night, the chief rabbi said, the Ashkenaz chief rabbi, Rabbi Metzger, which I think he paid our community a very great compliment. If you were there at the university, they had a, a video of the rabbi. All the rabbis spoke, of course, wonderful. But the chief rabbi said, you must know that the Syrian community is the best community in the world. Now, I don't think he was exaggerating. We didn't tell him to say that. We didn't give him a script to read it. He's a rabbi. He knows all the communities in the world. And for him to say that our community is the best community in the world, well, we know it. But when we hear it from somebody else, we say, wow, they know it also. They also, they also know the secret. And the reason why they say that is because of our ahdut, because of our commitment to tzedakah, because of our support. I'll tell you, a Hidush on Tzedakah. The Gan Eden. What a day. Unbelievable. <laughs> there was once a rabbi called the Satma Rebbe. The Satma Rebbe used to go to Miami for the winters because it was cold in New York. So he would go to Miami. So he was in Miami. It's okay, ladies, let them talk. Just pay attention in the talk. It's not a, it's not a synagogue. They can talk. The ladies don't have to learn to it out there. They're supposed to talk. So he was in Miami sitting under a palm tree, a coconut tree, and he's drinking a pina colada or a, a lemonade. So the Satma Rebbe looked at the people and he told his, boy, his students, he said, boys, this is galut. This is exile we're in. And then he turns around and he says, but if you have to be in exile, this is where to be. <laughs> And I say the same thing. Deal, we're in exile. But if you have to be in Galut, this is where to be in the Galut. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful place. The Mishnah says, "Ezu Ashir, Asameh Bechalko." Everybody knows this Mishnah. Who's a rich man? The Mishnah doesn't measure richness by decimal points. It doesn't measure it by how much money you have in your bank account or how much stocks you own. It says, Ezu Ashir, who is a rich man? Hasameyah bihalko. A person that's happy with his, with his lot. That means it's not the money, it's the, the state of mind, the happiness. If you're happy with what you have, you're rich. And this is the simple interpretation. There are some people that have a lot of money, but they're not satisfied. There was a very wealthy man, Rockefeller. They asked him, it was worth billions of dollars. They said, how much more money do you need to be satisfied? He said, a little more. <laughs> always a little more. And he kept on saying that till he died. It's always a little more. So he wasn't rich because he felt like he was missing something. He felt like he was needy. Well, you could have somebody that doesn't have so much, but he's content, he's happy, he has no problems. That's the Ashir. But I once explained a different interpretation to this Mishnah. I'd like to tell it to you today. Ezu Ashir, Asameh Abhalko means like this. The Gemara explains that a Kadosh Baruch Hu made poor people. Why did he make poor people? Why did he make people needy? Why doesn't he make everybody equal? Why should it be that there's people that have and there's people that have not? So the Gemara says that God does that in order to give the person who has money a zikhut. Because God wants to give the rich person a chance to do a mitzvah. 
And therefore the Gemara says, more than the rich man is doing for the poor man, the poor man is doing for the rich man. When a person gives an Ani Tzedakah, he says, oh, look what I did, I gave him Tzedakah. But you don't realize what the poor man gave you. The poor man gave you Ulam Abba for a hundred bucks. What's a hundred dollars? He gave you eternity, Gal Eden. So who got more? Who really took? For a hundred dollars, the Ani gave you something that's worth much more. So the Gemara says, more than you're giving the, the, the tzedakah, the tzedakah is giving you. So the Gemara explains like this. That a Kadosh Baruch Hu, he gives a person money, but 10% of his money doesn't belong to him. 10% of the money belongs to the poor people. But Hashem gives it to the rich man to give it to the... It's like there's some people in the community that have a charity account. And they hire a man to come to the office and he gives the tzedakah for the business. <coughs> that money is in a separate account. doesn't belong to anybody except the poor people. And the guy's job is writing checks. And Kadosh Baruch Hu says, listen, I have money I want to give to the Aniim. So he gives... Every person, 10%, 10%, 10%. And you're in charge of giving it out to the Aniim. You're my messenger. When we give the tzedakah to the poor people, we're doing what God wants. <coughs> it's not our money to spend. So what happens? A person goes along and makes a big party. They make a farah or whatever it may be. And they spend a lot of money. Flowers and food and a band and clothes and all the all the all the things that take to make a big party. After the party's over, the poor man or the rabbi comes by collecting for the yeshiva. Hacham, I just made a wedding. Calm down. You have to. I need time to to replenish. So the rabbi says, "Wait, whose money did you spend to make the wedding?" You spend my money to make the wedding. You have no right to spend my money. You have a right to spend your 90%, but you're not allowed to make a party on my dollar. That's what the Mishnah says. Ezu Ashir, who's the real rich man? Hasameyah, when he makes a simha, he spends his ilik, he spends his money. Don't spend the poor man's money on your parties. And then after the party, when they come to collect, oh, I have nothing. We made a Sabbath, we made a Sabbath, we made a, a, a different type of event. That's on your money. Don't spend somebody else's money to make a party. But I'd like to say a second interpretation. The second interpretation we said as follows. There was once a rich man, but he was a Kamsan. You know what a Kamsan is? He's a cheap. He doesn't know how to spend money. Kamsan bar Kamsan. He's a, a tightwad. So the rabbi went to collect Siddhaqah from him. And the rabbi walks into his house. He sees him eating jadra. He's eating rice and lentils. So he says, you, you're such a rich man. You're eating rice and lentils. You should be eating steak. You should be eating filet mignon. You should be drinking red wine. What is this? Rice and lentils. And the students couldn't believe it. What do you mean? The rabbi is telling him to eat steak? The guy's eating jadra. It's he's sadiq. Anyway, when the rabbi left, the students said, Hakam, what do you mean? Why are you telling him to? He said, I'll tell you why. He says, because if he's eating him jadra, the poor man's not going to get anything. Because when the poor man comes along and wants something, he's going to say, I eat the jadra, what should you get? But if he eats steak, maybe the poor man will get a piece of chicken. Which means if a person is cheap with himself, He's cheap with everybody. If the, if the guy comes and says, please, I need money for clothes. Clothes? This suit is 10 years old. I didn't buy a suit. You know what do you want? So, so if he doesn't spend on himself, how can he spend on other people as well? You have to spend on yourself to be able to spend on other people. So the Mishnah says, Ezu Ashir You have to be Sameyah with what you have. You have to spend on yourself. If you don't have to spend on yourself, you won't have to spend on other people as well. If you're cheap with yourself, you'll be cheap with, every, with everybody. But if a person spends on himself, then the Ani comes along and says, Ah, you'll be a sport. You say, you know what? Yeah, I also spend money. I give him also. Let him enjoy his life also. But if you're not Sameya with what you have, if you don't enjoy what God gave you on yourself, so then already nobody, no, 
No, nobody else stands a chance. Because you're always going to say, well, I don't have this, why should you have this? I don't do this, you shouldn't do this either. Oh, so then everybody gets, uh, everybody gets uh, turned down. That's the second interpretation. of Ezu Ashir, But we said another dirash on the Anyan of the Charity. We said like this. It says in the Pasuk, Naton Titen, it says when the people come and ask you for tzedakah, Naton Titen, give them. Don't be, uh, don't have a bad heart when they come and ask you. Keep a tawah tiftah. Torah says, because open your hands. So the Gaon the Vilna asked the following question What does it mean in the Pasuk? It says, give. And don't be hard. Don't, your heart shouldn't be stubborn when they come and ask you. Keep a tawah tiftah. Because a tawah tiftah, you have to open your hands. It's said in the writing in the beginning, Naton Titen. Why does it have to say, Keep Atawah Tiftah? It's like saying, Give, give, open, open. What's the double language? So the rabbi said an unbelievable hadush. He said, When a boy, when a baby is born, if you notice, the hands are closed. Every child is born with his hands closed. So the rabbi said, Why? Because every child inside of him wants to conquer the world. They want to take the whole world. They want to buy and they want to become big and they want to own everything. And they come into the world with such a, a, an aggressiveness. The world is mine. And then after 120 years, right before they bury the person, what's the last thing they do to the person? They open his hands. And at the end they say, with all his efforts and all his industriousness and all his diligence, what did he have in the end? Nothing. The only thing he takes with him is the tzedakot. The only thing that you take is the money that he has for the tzedakah. And that's what the Pasuk says. Naton titen. Give the money to the tzedakot. You know why? Keep atawah tiftah. Because after 120 years they're going to open your hands. Keep atawah tiftah. Not now. Then. And then you're going to see that all that you worked for, you have nothing. Yesterday, I was in Manhattan. What was I doing in Manhattan? Be'azat Hashem, we're building a synagogue. So the architect called me, said, Rabbi, let's go around Manhattan and look at different buildings so we can have an idea. This marble, this molding, even though it's not my uh, style to do that, but we have off of Yeshiva now as vacation. I went. I don't regret it. It was a wonderful day. We went to some of the different landmark buildings in Manhattan and the museums and we're looking, you like this, you don't like this, you want that, you like that. We went to a, a I was going to say synagogue, but it's not a synagogue. It's a temple on 5th Avenue, right across from the park. Emmanuel. It says on the, on the outside, Enze ki'im bet Elohim. That this is nothing except the house of God. It's a mistake. It should say, Enze Bet Elohim. It's not a house of God. They have a woman rabbi, organ, all these things. But we didn't go to get advice how to run a shul. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure. We cannot say no. It's a, one of the most magnificent structures. You, can, you, can, you think you're in Berlin. You think you're in Amsterdam. You don't know where you are. How could this building be in New York? Maybe the building is a half a billion dollars to build today. Anyway, we went into the building and the lady is giving us a tour. And she says, and the building was built in 1929. In 1929, that was the crash. The crash of the stock market. That's the, everybody lost their money. And she said, yes, but all those people that built this, this building they took their money out of the market and they put it in the structure. Those people that kept their money in the market, they have nothing to show for it. But those that took their money and put it in the tzedakot, the tzedakah remains forever. Which means the money that they worked for was gone. Only the money that they put in the tzedakah, that's still there today. A hundred years later, it's still there. 
And the truth is, it's right. There was a wealthy man. He said, Rabbi, I'm going to make a big donation for your synagogue. And he committed, and he went, I'm doing it, and it's done, and we want it. Where's the check? I'm going to give you the check, you'll get it. Okay, we trust you. These are honorable people. And then, he had the money. So just give it to us. You're going to get it. And all of a sudden, when the market turned, that money that was earmarked, lost. Now he says, Hakam, I can't give it to you anymore. He said, I regret it. Because it would have been much better in the synagogue than it is now. It's lost. Where is it? It's in the air. How about it's gone? It's, it's gone with the wind. So there you see that the only money that stays with us, there was a wealthy man called Rothschild. They went to Rothschild. They asked Rothschild, how much money are you worth? He said a very low number. The king said, what do you mean? You're worth 90% more than that. Why do you say such a low number? He said, no. You ask me what I'm worth. I'm only worth the money I gave to charity. All the other money comes and goes. Tomorrow the king can say, eminent domain, and confiscate all my money. What do I have? The market can crash, the gold can go down, the silver can go... This money over here is temporary. The Ben Yishai said, that's what we call money in the Gemara, Zuzim. You know what the word Zuz means in Hebrew? Zuz means move. Zuzim, because money is always moving. That's the, the wheel of money, the wheel of fortune. Money is always in motion. The velocity of money. Money always goes from one hand to another. It doesn't stay, it doesn't stay put. It doesn't stay in, in one place. The Ben Yishai said a story once. There was a, a, a little boy that they asked. He was a smart boy. The boy asked an older man. He said, I want to ask you a question. He says, there's ten birds on the roof. He said, I shoot two birds. How many birds are left? So the guy says, eight. He says, no, two. How can it be two? He says, because when you shoot two birds, the eight fly away and the two... Stay on the roof. That's the only one you have. So, ah. He said, that's the mashal. The nimshal is, the money has wings. The money is always flying all over. The only money that you have, you have to take the wings off the money. And what's that? The money that you give to tzedakah. The pasuk says, and then I'll conclude because I have to go to a wedding. The pasuk says, Hon ve'osher betoch beto." What does it mean? It's a pasuk at On the osher lebeto, he has wealth and opulence in his house. V'tzedkato omedet laad, and the tzedakah lasts forever. So he explained once like this: There was a fellow, an immigrant. He came from the old country to America, and he lived on the east side. He was a peddler. He sold bubble gum. He sold ties. And he made a small amount of money. Bizarre, he was able to live on it. He used to come to the Bet Knesset on the high holidays, and they would make a drive. Everybody's donating. They said, Mr. So-and-so, he says, I give one quarter. To him, that was a lot of money. Quarter was maybe a full day's salary. They, did, they put in, this, in the book, a quarter. And he pays it. As time went on, he went from a peddler, he opened a little retail store. Now, he's living a little better. Comes Rosh Hashanah Kippur, how much you want to give? Quarter, same as last year. I put quarter, scale mitzvot. And then, he opened up a few stores. And then from the retail, he said, you know what, what do I have to work so hard in the retail for? He opened up a wholesale business. A wholesale business, now he built a bigger house. Now he moved to an upscale neighborhood. Now he started, he bought a car. And slowly, slowly, Every year, his level of wealth was growing. But one thing stayed the same. His charity. When they came to him for the tzedakah, same as last year, put me down for a quarter. So the rabbi said, I knew, now I understand what the pasuk says. Hon ve'osher bebeto. He has wealth, and he has opulence in his house. His house keeps on getting bigger. And his life keeps on getting bigger. But one thing stays the same. The sitkato, when it comes to a tzedakah, omedet la'ad. It stands in the same place forever. The tzedakah is the only thing that doesn't move. 
Same as last year. Your house is not the same as last year. You don't have last year's car. You don't have last year's clothes. Everything else, you upgraded. But the tzedakah is the only one that stays the same. That doesn't change. Like there was a little boy, his mother gave him two dollars and said, son, one dollar is for the ice cream truck and one dollar is for the tzedakah. When you go to school, you give tzedakah for charity. So the boy was holding the two dollars, shaking in his hands on the way to school. And all of a sudden, a wind came and blew one of the dollars and it flew and it landed in the sewer. And the boy is standing there and he's thinking, and all of a sudden he turns to God and said, that was your dollar. <laughs> Whenever a person loses, Hashem loses. Hashem's the first one to be, to be taken off the list. The last thing we take off is from our own. The Sifkato Amid Ta'at, Ashrikim Benot Israel, God bless you ladies. Nashim Sifkaniyot, the righteous woman of our community, and of Am Yisrael, that Baruch Hashem generate so much charity and so much goodwill and so much Torah that you're studying. A community is lucky because the women who are the foundation of Am Yisrael, the Shud Nashim Sifkaniyot, the Gadu Abotenu Ben Yisrael, we were redeemed because of Nashim Sifkaniyot. And the rabbis tell us that the final redemption will be like the original redemption. Also, Bishkut Nashim Sitkaniyot. Baruch Hashem, our community can be very proud that we can boast that we have such an army of uh, righteous women, Tehorot, Vikidoshot, that are doing great things. Hashem should always put you in the position to give. You should always be in the position to help. You should always have, like we said in the Parashah last week, Hashem Elokechem. Yosef Alechem Kachem Elef Pa'amim That God should give you a thousandfold Amen Amen, Amen.